Holy Spirit works. Uh, the song choice could not, could not have lined up more perfectly. Um, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I mean, exulting in Christ, glorifying in Christ. It's beautiful. All right, without further delay, let us turn to Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. And let me see if I can find There we go. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. The Word of God. Please be seated. What is the gospel? It's kind of, I don't know, vital, wouldn't you say, to the Christian message. What is the gospel? Well, it simply means good news. Well, that begs the question, what is the good news? Well, do you want the good news or do you want the bad news? Most people, they pick the bad news first. Why? Because when you pick the bad news first and the good news follows, it's an uplift. It's an encouragement but when the good news comes before the bad news, the bad news almost negates the good news. So today I will seek to tell you the bad news first. And you'll have to endure, but praise God for the good news. The bad news is, you are a sinner. Verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. The good news, Christ, that comes in four different parts. Four different parts we will cover today. Christ dies, Christ saves, Christ lives, and Christ reigns. Paul is lovingly alerting us to the dire state in which humanity finds itself. Like a blind man walking into oncoming traffic blissfully unaware of the danger that is barreling down the highway towards him. How will he understand the imminent danger he's in, the impending doom, the grave danger, and the salvation that he so desperately needs? Helpless, weak, unable, incapable, powerless. These are the types of words this passage uses. Unable to do it on your own incapacitated in regards to your own salvation. And yet, you can't, and yet you must, simultaneously account for your actions before God. Doomed to die and face Him. At the right time, in verse 6. This conveys when the time was ripe, in due time, at the perfect moment, Christ died at the day and hour foretold, and not a second before or after. Right on schedule, all according to God's foreordained, providential, and predestined grace, the Father has planned from eternity past. Ungodly is probably the key term in this passage. It identifies those who Christ died for. Look at it again. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. It directs the death of Christ. And it is so crucial. Did die, Christ die for you? Well, what does that mean? That means you are the ungodly in this passage. We find ourselves at enmity before God. If you were not ungodly, Christ did not die for you. 
And Jesus himself says this in Luke 5, 31, 32. And Jesus answered them, those who are well, well, good on their own, righteous, supposedly, have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We say so-and-so is a good person. You know, oh yeah, he's a great guy. Maybe if you compare apples to apples. But we are comparing man, man, to God. We are comparing the finite to the infinite. And we are comparing the temporal to the everlasting. There is no comparison, and you don't stand a chance. Your only hope is Him. If you think you are a good person, you are deluding yourself. You think you'll stand before the great white throne judgment? You fool yourselves. All because you think yourself to be, quote, a good person. No, Christ died for the ungodly. You could not be more mistaken. Look at Isaiah 64, 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Just as an exercise, Ray Comfort uses this in his street evangelism. I want you to raise your hand for every rule that you have kept. And we're only going through ten of God's rules, God's commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. Nope. Not a chance. Anything you put before God. How about, thou shalt not make any graven images. Well, have you made yourself a God? A God you can worship? A God who doesn't look like the biblical God? A God who is comfortable? A God who is accepting of your sin? What about the commandments 3 and 4? Thou shalt keep the Sabbath and keep it holy. Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. Have you dishonored God in any way? Reduced His glory in any fashion? And I don't know about you, but I'm neck deep in sin every single day of the week. Commandment number five, honor thy father and mother. If you think you've kept this one, ask your parents, okay? <laughs> what about commandment number six? Thou shalt not murder. Well, I didn't commit that one. Oh, wait. Jesus says in the New Testament that if you have anger in your heart, you have killed a man. I mean, it's like hate is merely unacted murder. What about adultery? I'm not even married yet, you know. Oh, but if you look at a woman with lust, if you look at a person with lust, you're not married to them. That's adultery. What about commandments 8, 9, and 10? Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, and thou shalt not covet. I mean, I don't mean to point out the obvious, but nobody raised our hands. We all fall short of the glory of God. For the believer, as Mike Winger says, you are either wrong about the good person part, or you are wrong about the going to heaven part. For the unbeliever, I dare say that you're probably wrong about both. You are ungodly. Without God, I am ungodly. Everyone in this room is ungodly if God does not intervene. If you are an unbeliever, this is the judgment that hangs over you right now in the current present. For the believer, this is the judgment that we have been saved from, which is why it's all the more important to remember what salvation Christ has brought. Not only judged as completely ungodly, but according to verses 6, 8, and 10, naturally helpless, ungodly, 
sinners who are enemies of God. You say this is harsh. Scripture is harsh in regards to this. I mean, it naturally, it accurately depicts the disgusting depravity of man. That's why it's repulsive. That's why we don't like it. That's why we cover it up and try to justify it. Turn to Romans earlier, chapter 1, the very first chapter of Romans. And verses 28 through 29. This whole chapter 1 is beautiful, but just for now, 28 and 29. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer... God gave them over to depraved mind, to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Not enough for you? Turn to Romans chapter 3, just a few chapters after. Chapter 3, 11 through 12. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands, none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good, and there is not even one. Continues. Their throat is an open grave. Their tongues keep deceiving. The poison of snakes, venom, asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. In the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We sit inside a courtroom today. And we are the ones on trial. And this may not be an issue. I mean, we're good people, right? Only the judge is just. And perfectly so. In fact, when he undergoes his thorough examination, he doesn't miss a thing. And you being the defendant, sit helplessly as the judge sits on his bench, listing your charges. The judge upholding justice finds you guilty of your crimes. There is no higher court to appeal to. As he reads your charges against you, the only question left is how do you plead? Do you plead innocent? Do you plead guilty? How is there salvation for the believer? Those who claim innocence are still condemned. If anything, they call the judge a liar. After Paul explains this problem of humanity, this predicament that we find ourselves in, he then moves to the great hope of humanity. Oh, finally, the good news is coming. So much so, these verses, this passage in Romans has actually been called the John 3.16 of Romans. What is John 3.16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal, everlasting, infinite, ongoing life. That, that's the hope. That's Christ. Christ is life. Christ brings life. Christ brings us to life, into life. The truth is, the only right answer is not a defense. It's to plead guilty. Suddenly, once you plead responsible for your actions, no hope in yourself, an advocate steps in. It all happens so fast. You, you look, and this guy, he steps in, and you pray that his defense is able and is confident and sure and saves you from your crimes. Despite your felonies which deserve a death sentence, this lawyer volunteers to die in your place. The judge grieves for the man, but he must uphold justice. And the lawyer smiles back at you, and you have a feeling this was planned beforehand to have you acquitted. Exhibit A, Christ died. Verse 7, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, Though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. The truth is, this verse serves to paint a picture. And this picture is of the average, human, typical, usual, ordinary love. And it's the human love. Humans 
Love what is lovable. Cherish what is already valuable. We may even die for others, but you know, just as long as they're worth dying for, right? Even this is difficult to find. One naturally asks, okay, who is the guy? And is he worth my life? That's the predicament we find ourselves in when we look at our love. No, that's saying if you don't love me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. Yeah, well, the problem with that is that Christ did love you at your worst. And we don't even have a best to present him. It's this complete, almost unbelievable type of love. The settlement was made before you even entered the court. The advocate knew you were guilty and yet displayed just how much he loved you as a client. And he laid down his life for you. The verdict is made. And you are set free. Verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I believe it was Martin Lord Jones who said, thank God for the buts in the Bible. But God, those two words, don't they bring joy to the heart of a Christian? We stand condemned, no hope, and yet he comes. He saves, he steps in, and he dies, and he leads us into this second point. Jesus saves, Christ saves. Remember that picture? That canvas that so accurately depicted the state of the human? Yeah, well, this next verse busts through that like the Kool-Aid man bursting through the wall, you know. Oh, yeah! You know, it's just, it totally blows our minds. Though we may be helpless, we are not hopeless. Close your eyes and picture another painting. One that has Christ at the center. One that has the Lamb of God. One that depicts Him in all His glory. And one that shows perfectly His love towards you. That's the gospel. The painting which illustrates the most love a human can have yet. Just forget about that. God's love is at the center. There's only one son. The spotless lamb of God. This picture depicts the king of kings. Christ. Who voluntarily sacrifices himself for those who hate him the most. The painting is all about God who demonstrates and determines and displays his own infinite love. He turns to you and says... I love you, but not because of who you are, but because of who I am. I am who I am. Don't you see the bad news, the dreadful painting, the courtroom, the judgment that hangs over our heads? That's us. That's our situation. That's who we are. Christ? The good news? Oh, it's all about him. He is the good news. While we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. God does not love you. He loves you in spite of you. In fact, he didn't die for what you could give him, new flesh, but he died for what he could give you. He loves you with an infinite, eternal love if you have been chosen by him, if you have been saved by him, if you've been bought by him with his own blood. Charles Spurgeon says, the only thing I contribute that is, I give, that is, I earn, to my salvation, is the sin that made it necessary. Because the gift of salvation is completely unearned, completely unmerited, absolutely unmerited, absolutely undeserved, utterly undeserved, we can see that salvation does not depend on us. Ready for some good news? Because we do not win salvation. We cannot lose our salvation. You see, if God chose to love you, you are saved. You shall be saved. Once saved, always saved, if truly saved. Salvation wasn't won by us. It's called eternal life. It's not like a daisy, you know, he loves me, he loves me not. No, Christ's love is secure. Verse 9. I mean, it's completely up to him. The only thing left to do is respond. Verse 9, much more than 
Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Lest you think this was the end. No, no. Scripture has more in store for you to read. No, God has more to say to you today. If we want to emphasize something, you know, we typically put it in bold, underline it. Maybe shout it louder. No, back then it was interesting. When they wanted to emphasize something, they just repeated it and repeated it and repeated it over and over and over. <coughs> Rephrasing. Restating. Recommitting to memory. And reiterating himself over and over and over until the truth is deeply embedded into our understanding. That's how they did it. And God is merciful. He continues to state this. Christ demonstrated his own love for us. Christ died for the ungodly. So that we shall be saved. God is merciful. But he's also angry and just. If you watch a vile crime being committed, righteous indignation bubbles up inside of you. Something inside. That says, this is evil. It must be stopped. This is wrong. This should be punished. But my dear friends, that righteous anger falls on our own heads. As the evil in the world is man's rebellion, the very sin that we ourselves possess. The truth is, God is patient, gracious, merciful, and slow to anger. And yet he is angry with you every day until you depend. For proof of this, turn to Psalm 7. Verses 11 through 12. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. If a man does not repent, if a man does not repent, if a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons. And he makes his arrows fiery shafts. Only then, when one repents, is God merciful in the fullest. Yes, he's merciful in the sense that he has delayed judgment. Unbelievers can watch a beautiful sunrise. Unbelieving farmers have rain for their crops to support their family. And yet judgment awaits. He is just. He can't overlook sin and sweep it under the carpet. If you are one of God's children, however, when you go up to those pearly gates, when you show up to that great white throne, God will look at you and he will smile and he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. How is this possible? Why does God do this? I mean, the infinite, holy, perfect, and just God letting a sinner pass through? You? This is a contradiction, it seems. Oh, but good news. Because when he looks at you and he smiles and he says those beautiful words, he no longer sees your sin. But he sees his own son. He sees his own blood which has covered you. His own righteousness that has been poured over you. Which has clothed you in a robe of white. That's what he sees. And he shall receive you into the fullness of his presence. Exhibit B. Point two. Christ saves. As Christ died for you. Do you belong to Christ? I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon to figure it out. Does God own me? Do I belong to Him? Is my everything His? Forget the past. Forget yourself. Forget what you bring to the table. And depend solely on Christ today. Depend solely on his merit. Depend solely on his righteousness. And determine today if God has chosen you. But God loves unconditionally, so I'm fine. 
says the guy dead in his sins. No. Luke 13, 3 states, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. When someone dies, what do we say? Typically, be honest. He was a good man. He's in a better place now. I hate to say this, and it is grieving. It should grieve every single one of us. So much so that we can't help but tell others and warn others. But unless they put their faith in Jesus Christ, they are not in a better place. Unless Jesus Christ has paid for their sins, their sins are still accounted to them. Unless they have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, they won't go to heaven. In fact, Re Revelation, Jesus describes hell. And though it may be literally, though it may be metaphorically, I think we all can get the picture that he paints. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Revelation 14. A lake that burns with eternal fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Revelation 21. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Sin against God. An infinite God can only deserve infinite punishment. And if he is just, if he is good, if he is God, he must uphold justice. Sin against God. So-called good people go to hell all the time. And yet, Proverbs 28, 13, you want to know why we say good people? It's because they hide their sin. Because their sin is concealed. It's not obvious. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Do you depend on Christ? Is Christ your all in all? Are you good or are you saved? John 3, 35, 36 reads, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, and whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. What are you saved from, dear Christian? You are saved from God, and you are saved by God, and you are saved through God, and you are saved for God. Do we see that today? The truth is, you see, God loves the Son with an infinite, eternal, everlasting, unconditional love. And it is only when the ungodly sinner enemy of God is redeemed by Christ, covered by Christ, wed to Christ, one with Christ's body and bride, that that unconditional, everlasting, and infinite love is then extended to the believer, to those who belong to Christ. Do you belong to Christ? If Christ died for you while you were a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad person, how much more, having been reconciled already, shall you be saved? And this is the ultimate assurance, the ultimate hope that a Christian has. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. This is the love that we see. John 6, 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. And I will raise Him up on the last day. Let's look at verse 10. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Much more than the fact that Christ died for me. Much more than the fact that He was whipped and scourged for me. Much more than the fact that His bloody back drug against that coarse tree is that He lives for me. Christ lives for me. Christ has been resurrected. And He stands 
at the right hand of God. He stands ascended. He was coronated. He lives. And He stands as a testament to the eternal life, the new body that He can give to you today, that He has given Christians. I know I am given eternal life because of His resurrection, because of His new life. Much more than even this, the death of Christ takes our sin, but the life of Christ gives us His righteousness. I mean, it's the ultimate buy low, sell high. You know, it's, it's absolutely incredible. If Christ took what was in our cup out, the sin, the ungodly, he then poured in the cup his righteousness, his perfect, his perfection, his fulfilling of the law. And he does so to where it overflows. You know, like when you forget and you just blank out and then all of a sudden there's a bunch of liquid and water all over the counter. Yeah, that's what happens to the Christian. He lavishingly pours out his righteousness. So much so that it spills all around us. And we become the light of Christ. Point three, exhibit C. Christ lives. If we are forgiven as God's enemies, certainly, assuredly, I tell you, we shall be forgiven as his children. Verse 11, we have to continue. Not only this, but we also exalt in God. Not only this, much more than. Paul is adding to every single layer that he has built thus far. Though you were ungodly, guess what? Christ died for the ungodly. Though you were a sinner, guess what? Christ lives for the ungodly. Guess what? While you were an enemy of God... Christ saves enemies of God. Verse 11, Christ reigns. Not only this, on top of that, Warren Wiersbe puts this beautifully, totally apart from the law and purely by grace, we have a salvation that takes care of the past, the present, and the future. Christ died for us, Christ lives for us, and Christ is coming for us. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! He has brought, bought us. He, we serve the King of Kings who sits on His throne. The only thing left to do is praise and adore Him for that salvation that He has given you. He has bought us. We serve the King of Kings who sits on His throne. After Christ dies for us, He lives for us. And after we live through Him, He come to the final point, Christ reigns. Give praise to the totally, completely, absolutely worthy Lamb of God who was shed on your behalf. You may be listening today, whether on the stream, in your seat, just now hearing about the true gospel. God hates sin, but chose to love the sinner in spite of it and died to take your sin from you and cast it as far as the east is from the west. Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore to me the joy of your salvation. Let us cry that today. Acts 17, 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. If you didn't know, you do now. You are accountable for God. You can't pay the debt. And your only hope is to trust that he will, that he did and that you shall be saved. Jesus says to you today, Mark 1, 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. It's before you today. Repent and believe in the gospel, the good news. Second Chronicles 39 states, For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from any." From you, if you return to him. For the one who doubts his salvation today, who believes that God just, you know, hates them now, who thinks they're too far gone, return to him. If you don't feel God's presence, 
Return to Him. The Christian life isn't just repent and believe once and the ticket golden is punched. That's not the Christian life. It is a life continuously walking the narrow road. It's continuously forgetting all distractions, even yourself, and depending on Christ, trusting in Christ completely, and believing that He alone can save you. It's a Christian life. If you're backsliding, if you're depressed, if you're downtrodden, the answer that Paul is giving you today as you face your trials in Romans 5 is to praise God, is to remember the salvation that has been granted to you. We have been saved so much that if you lack joy, all you have to do is turn around and look at the cross. It brings so much joy to the Christian of what they have been saved, it immediately fills us up and spills out to others. For those who think they have just done too much, unworthy of God's love, I got good news for you. While we were yet sinners, do you doubt the great king? Do you doubt his decree, his word to you today? Do you not believe that he is the only one who can save you? His mercies are new every morning, Lamentations 3.22-23. through 23. He did it. He did it all. If you have been saved, you are now the light. Share the joy an eternal life that Christ has given you. Share this message. Tell a friend. I mean, you can't help but show to others the joy that God has given you through His Son. Testify the bad news first, sure, but give them the good news and praise God for it. Tell them the gospel. As the ladies come up, if his blood covers you, it covers your sin every bit. Every falling, every slip up, every sin. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Stop relying on your own merit and completely depend on Christ today. Believe in His saving work on the cross. He hung for you on that tree, didn't He? He drank the cup of the wrath of God for you fully, completely, not a drop left. Believe in His righteousness to save now, right now. None of us are granted, promised, guaranteed another moment. None of us are assured we may even make it home from this building today. We must depend on Christ forsaking everything else and come to Him. Repent and believe and praise our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have received the reconciliation. There's a, I believe it's a hymn, maybe a poem by a Puritan, old Christians of the past. And you know what it said? Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I clean. Christ died, Christ saves, Christ lives and Christ reigns. Let us pray. Dear God, you have shown us our sin today. You have given us an opportunity not many receive. Lord, don't let this chance pass us by. If you are calling us, if we feel something within us, that is the Holy Spirit drawing you, calling your name, bringing you closer to himself, asking, are you willing to give everything up? Eric Little said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Lord, let us see that it is only when we depend fully, 
trusting in no other thing but the rock of salvation that is Christ, that we can be saved. Despite all our sin, despite our failures, Lord, you have chosen to save us. Let us look to your son. Let us look to his sacrifice and look to your everlasting love which you demonstrated through him. Finally, if we're an unbeliever, let us give it all to you. Turning to Christ. Fully accepting the gift that God already paid for and has given. And if, you're not, if you are a believer, if you are a Christian, if you are born again, regenerated, with a new heart of flesh, whose righteousness has been poured overwhelmingly, whose grace has been given God's grace fully, completely, abundantly. Let us then spill it on others. Let us show the light like a lamp on the hill. Let us tell others while the moment is passing, while the temporal life is fleeting, and while judgment waits for them on the other side, let us stand and have the privilege of sharing the gospel. Lord, thank you for giving us this opportunity of telling others about you, of telling others the good news, the bad news, the good, the bad, the ugly, and giving them the gospel, giving them you. Lord, dwell us today, sanctify us today, fill us with the Holy Spirit today. That way we can then share the light. And finally, let us be encouraged in the salvation of Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him. In His presence daily live. I surrender Do you surrender all, all today? I surrender. Thank you for what, thank God for what he has done. And in light of that, exit the church today with the renewed confidence in the salvation of Christ, that he died, that he saves, that he lives, and that he reigns. May God bless you, may he keep you, and may his face shine upon you. Have a great week. Mwah.